Good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning at First Unitarian Church of Rochester. Ooh, wait, I screwed this up. We did this whole sound check this morning and somehow got shoved inside. I am so sorry about that. I don't normally wear a mask, but I am just getting over COVID. I'm on day 14 and I'm not quite 100%. So I'm just gonna wear a mask for today. It is so good to be with all of you. So good to gather with you in person and online, enjoying each other's company, having a chance to settle in our week, to hear, hopefully, inspiration, something that gives you courage, something that gives you hope, and also in a space where we keep each other safe, where we respect each other's agency. Here at First Unitarian Church of Rochester, it is our mission that through spiritual connection in community, we listen deeply to others and ourselves, we open to wonder and transformation, and we serve together with love and humility. I'm Reverend Sherry, I'm one of the ministers that serves this congregation, along with Reverend AJ, who you'll see today leading worship online because of a possible COVID exposure. So he'll be joining us online. We've got Tommy and Joe and the ukulele orchestra making music today. We've got lots of folks behind the scenes making Sunday happen. And we are joined today for the first of many weeks this summer with, by Massey Williams, who is serving as our lay worship associate and will be working with me and Reverend AJ this week as she decides whether or not she'd like to go into ministry. Massey grew up in this congregation and is a founding member of the Unitarian Universalist Club at Ithaca College. And Massey, welcome home. I welcome you and you and you here to this space to settle into this sacred hour where we gather on the ancestral and contemporary land of the Seneca people, the keepers of the Western door of the Haudenosaunee. We pay respect and acknowledge with gratitude the keepers of this land, and we take up our call as keepers of this community, stewards of each other's well-being. If you are going through a hard time or you're worried about someone else, I invite you to connect with a member of our pastoral care team. We've got a chat chaplain online as well as at the back of the sanctuary. And if during the service or afterwards, you'd like to pull them aside and talk, I invite you to do so. I'm just taking you in for a moment. It has been four weeks since I have been here. I've missed a couple of weeks because of COVID, and I am so grateful to be back among you. Thank you all for being this church. Church doesn't happen just because those of us who are here on screen or on stage make it happen. What we do on Sunday morning in worship, what we do when we gather to remember and anchor in what is most important in our lives is truly the work of the people. And so I ask you to join me in our unison words as we light our chalice. And if you're at home, I invite you to light a chalice there. Massey will light our chalice. Woo, ukulele orchestra creeps up on me. <laughs> but I love you. Let us say these words together. May the flame we now kindle inspire us to use our power to heal with love, to help with compassion, to bless with joy, and to seek liberation in the fullness of community. So sometime last year, one of you, right before a gathering just like this, handed me an envelope with earrings a little bit like this. And then we did this thing, and somehow I lost one of the earrings. These earrings are from the tops of vaccine, vaccination vials. And the doctor who made these earrings handed it to me and said, I thought you might want to wear a little bit of history. 
And I did, I desperately did. But somehow in the hubbub of all that we do when we gather, I lost one. And I was deeply sad and ashamed that I had been careless with someone's gift, that I had somehow lost something that someone had made for me that surely was precious. I remember when we were all wondering when our time would come to be vaccinated for COVID. And so I said nothing for months and looked around every corner of this building and my home and hoped that it would turn up, but it didn't. And so I said nothing. Until finally I found myself in a one on one conversation with this person and confessed. They said, we have given so many shots. It's not a rarity. I'll make you another pair. <laughs> and so the next week, right before something like this, they handed me an envelope and well, here it was again, except these were different. These weren't pink and purple like the first pair, but green and orange, uglier somehow, and yet still delightful, but different. And I think this is why we come to church. We come because we are a people of second chances. We come because there is grace in community. And when we return again to the thing that we thought we had fudged before, well, it's not the same. Something is slightly different, but we still get another chance.
people don't give online yet. <laughs> Typically, at this time, we would invite you into prayer, and Reverend AJ will do so by video in just a few moments. We follow that with a time of community ritual, of witnessing to each other of all that happens in our lives. And so let us reverse these today. Let us enter into ritual, into bearing witness into each other's lives, into that which is heaviest on our hearts, or that we wish to celebrate with one another. Whatever it is that's most present from our week, set it down here. Lay it on the altar of community and spirit, honoring the complexities of life. Whatever grief, whatever growth, whatever gratitude is alive in each of you, I invite you to bring it into community. And so online, I invite you to share in the chat. And here in the sanctuary, I invite you to arrive at one of our altars in the aisle and to light a candle for your grief, your gratitude, and your growth. And I'll remind you, because our rates are quite high, please don't lower your mask to extinguish the candle, but use the snuffer. May we now share in this ritual of community care. For all that is in our hearts, for ourselves, for each other, and for the world, may we be held in loving community. I invite you into a ritual of meditation and prayer. Good morning. I'm joining you all virtually today as a precaution following a possible COVID exposure, but rest assured I have tested negative so far. I want to offer you this morning a, an embodied practice adapted from Thich Nhat Hanh. This is a practice for relaxation and gratitude, and it's something you can return to anytime you need it. This practice does go through various body parts and functions, and we know that not all bodies are the same shape or have the same ability. So if you need to reinterpret any part of this practice for the unique body that is your body, 
please do so. So I invite you to relax into wherever you are seated. If you're at home and this is feasible, you can even lie on your back somewhere for this practice, but it is by no means necessary. Wherever you are, just relax your body, become aware of the chair and the floor beneath you, or whatever is holding up your body. Allow your body to relax into wherever it is being held by gravity. Become aware of your breathing in and out. Become aware of your abdomen rising and falling. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your eyes. Breathing out, allow your eyes to relax. Your eyes might treat you to a paradise of form and color. Send love and gratitude to your eyes. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your mouth. And breathing out, allow all the tiny muscles in your mouth to relax. Maybe let a gentle smile bloom on your lips. Send love and gratitude to your mouth. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your shoulders. Breathing out, allow your shoulders to relax. Your shoulders might be where you carry so many of your burdens and weights. Send love and gratitude to your shoulders. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your arms and hands. Breathing out, allow your arms and hands to relax. Your arms and hands might be what reach out into the world and bring it close to you. Send love and gratitude to your arms and hands. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your heart. Breathing out, allow your heart to relax. Your heart beats for you night and day. Send love and gratitude to your heart. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your legs and feet. Breathing out, allow your legs and feet to relax. Your legs and feet might be what carry you throughout the world. Send love and gratitude to your legs and feet. Breathing in, bring your awareness to your whole body. Breathing out, allow your whole body to relax. Your body is beautiful and good and is always with you. You are your body. Send love and gratitude to your whole body. And that's the practice, in essence, breathing in and breathing out. Bringing awareness, allowing relaxation. Sending love, sending gratitude. Now remaining in this place of deep relaxation, love and gratitude, I invite you into a few moments of silence before I begin the pastoral prayer.
great mystery which grounds us and surrounds us. Divine presence known by many names and in many ways. We come together in community to cultivate our highest ideals within our hearts and minds, to feed the wild free spirits within us, to practice the tenacity of faith that the bruised and broken world we inhabit desperately calls for, and to hold and to care for one another as we navigate these trying times. May we have love and gratitude for ourselves and each other, for those healing from wounds, physical, psychological, and spiritual, for those navigating COVID diagnoses and other illnesses, health scares and other recalibrations and reorganizations that have to be done due to new medical realities. May we have love and gratitude for those lives cut short from the evils of gun violence, state violence and war, and love for those who are still hurting from these evils. And also for those struggling just to be safe as their authentic, true selves, living in states and countries and school districts that would ban the truth of who they are and access to the science and healthcare that will help them lead healthy lives. May we send love and gratitude to those who loved us into being, who paved the way as ancestors coming before us, those who nurtured and nurture us still. May we pay this love and nurturing forward, loving others into being their best, most authentic selves as we all bloom along with this beautiful spring around us, knowing that the flower needs the sun and the rain and the soil and the insect and all other beings to inter-exist. Grounded in this love and gratitude, may we do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, with each other and with that abiding love which holds us all, always. May it be so. Blessed be and amen. Keep it going. Ah, 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 
Each week, members and friends generously contribute to our offering, which helps to sustain and grow our community. This collection supports the work and witness of our church, and each week, we give half of this collection to a partner organization, helping those in need and working to create a more just and loving world. This week, we are sharing the plate collection with Metro Justice. Metro Justice is a Rochester-based grassroots organization committing to fighting for racial justice and combating wealth inequality within our city community. You can give online at rochesterunitarian.org donate or on Venmo or in our baskets. Our offering will now be received with gratitude. Our reading this morning is from the white American poet Maggie Smith, Good Bones. Life is short, though I keep this for my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep for my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this for my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird, for every loved child, ch there is a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short, and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this for my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. We don't often say shithole in church, but sometimes the times demand it. And 
you'll forgive me this, because what I have to say is a little bit vulnerable, so I'm going to backtrack a moment, because I forgot the announcements earlier, and I'm going to cover that by sharing them with you now, which is to say, it's a little early to be thinking about the December holidays, and yet here at First Unitarian, sometimes we plan ahead, and our central communal spiritual practice in December is our greater good service and ritual in which we gather our collective gifts. And our greater good team is accepting nominations now. So if you have an idea of an organization that we should support, talk to them outside. Thinking about money, thinking about greater good, our budget forum is this afternoon, as well as Tuesday evening. And then finally, I've been enjoying the return of a chance for those of us in person to have coffee, to connect, to be with each other in community. But we need more volunteers to make it happen. So have a cup of coffee afterwards and sign up. I say all of these things to you because they are the doings and weavings of regular church. I say all of these things to you because I have missed it so over the last couple of weeks. I am one of these people who tends to ignore when I'm uncomfortable or a little bit under the weather or in need of some help. I say this not to brag. I say this as a confession as a commitment to do better, knowing this about myself, that when I'm in pain, it's a chance to check in with my body and do something different. But when I tip the scales between ignoring something to acknowledging that something is not quite right, I am also one of those people who becomes deeply, deeply dramatic. When I am sick, you will know it especially if you live with me. And suddenly, though I seem to be awake for only three hours a day, I need soup and snacks and cough syrup and so much water. And so 10 days ago, as I lie dying, clear that I would never see any of you again, and did I get a chance to say I love you enough, I thought about the last time I was with you, which was four weeks ago, which is a really long time in the life of a congregation. It's been a long time since I've seen you all. It was Earth Day, and I was thinking about what I preached to you that day, which some of you may remember, but most of you probably don't, because let's be honest, it was last month, that ultimately it is the thing, the message, that runs through my body and my life, that is the core of every sermon that I preach, and how I didn't do a very good job of it. This is not what you want to be thinking if you think you're on your way out, but there I was. And we know that perfection is never the goal. We know that when we gather here and the video doesn't work exactly when we think it is, it will happen eventually or it won't. And it does matter, we do want it to work, but if it doesn't, well, perfection was never the goal. Connection is why we come together. And we give ourselves chances again and again. And so I return to that sermon from four weeks ago, return to what it means to live on planet Earth as a person in community, as a human in the year 2022, not in pursuit of perfection, but in pursuit of what we as a community offer each other in connection, what we have by way of inspiration and courage and hope. Situating ourselves in the climate apocalypse feels like a particularly shitty thing this fortnight as I lie wondering if I would return to all of you and in what shape I would be. We got bad news after bad news. 
the probable fall of Roe v. Wade, and more mass shootings. 10 dead in Buffalo, riding on an ideology of hatred and white supremacy. Bad news after bad news. And yet here we are all together. What I have to say today is what I should have said four weeks ago and what I will have to say four weeks from now, but also know that in four weeks, it will not be me preaching. We have got a glorious set of services coming up led by our coming of age youth, by Tommy and our music ensembles, by all the ways this community holds us together. But as I lie dying, this was the message that was most urgent that I need you all to know about what it means to live and minister within you. I carry within me a theory of social change that has three levels. It begins with resistance and then goes on to reform and then ends with rebuilding. Now, those are not linear. Those three things happen all at the same time, but we resist in community that which does harm. In our public witness, in our protest, in our claiming of a moral voice as a religious community of values that proclaims something different than what a state of oppression and empire whispers into our lives is resistance. This often is the thing that leaps up in many of our bodies. It's the thing that is most awakened by a cycle of outrage that rides on news reports and politics. We often rush to this because it is the thing that is for many of us, but not all, the most easily accessible. But we also dwell here, sometimes only here, because I believe a lack of honesty about the power and agency that we hold in this world. To resist is important, but to reform, to work within systems, and to claim the power, agency, and authority that we have as a congregation, as individuals, as decision makers in our workplaces, in our government, in our homes, and in our communities. To take up that power and to move with it. Well, this is the second layer of social change. The first comes from a moment of doing justice, reform, well, it's a love of mercy. And the third, to rebuild, it demands that we reimagine new ways of being. It demands that we build up alternative institutions outside of the ones that currently exist that do not serve us, do not serve our siblings, and do not serve those most harmed by existing oppressive situations. To rebuild requires us to break the mental and social bonds that keep us attached to the status quo, to the old way of doing things. This journeying humbly, in so many ways it demands something new of us, new ways of participating in the economy, new ways of participating in community. But hardly ever is it something entirely novel. This rebuilding is often a return to old ways of building. To learn to use and make food and clothing and medicines and households and finance 
All of these are old skills to teach each other how to garden, to repair clothing, to give money to those that we see each other in community with. These are simply old ways of being, old ways of being the church. Now, First Unitarian and Unitarian Universalism as an institution, we operate at each of these levels, but it's this last one, the rebuilding of reimagining and returning to old ways of being that is the church's central role. But these operate not only externally, but also within our own souls within our own beings, each of these three levels that call us to do justly, to love mercy, and to journey humbly with that which is most sacred, most divine, these operate within us also. And so we're called to resist, to resist the demons of patriarchy and white supremacy that whisper into our lives that we are only good if we are producing, that the institutions that we are a part of, where the status quo protects some over the well-being of others, can continue. This deep and holy no that claims a moral authority to see evil in our lives and say there must be another way to reduce the harms of contemporary living that tempt us into hardening our hearts, turning away from compassion, and no longer seeing the stranger as our neighbor. We are called into a holy resistance to these messages of hatred and fear and greed. The reform of our spirits and our souls, our internal lives, is a long haul process. Just as it is in social institutions, so too are we, even the youngest, youngest among us, a little bit entrenched. So many of us come into religious life hoping that like that, something will be new. But it hardly ever works that way. If you think the process of governance is slow, well, I have bad news about spiritual practice. Each and every time you do a body scan of love and gratitude like Reverend AJ led us in, each and every time you enter into prayer, maybe not even knowing what prayer is, each and every time you gather on Sunday morning in collective practice, you lay one sheet of paper on another, knowing that one day you'll need a stack, but you don't know how high. And from day to day or week to week, it's hard to tell the difference. But like all processes of reform, it is slow and honorable and necessary work. And then there's the rebuilding the reimagining, the return. This reimagining, it calls us to try new things in our spiritual lives. This coming summer, we'll ask our Soul Matters groups and all of you in small groups to learn a song together. For some, this will be easy. For the longtime choir members, you will think, well, gosh, is this spiritual practice? But for others, it will be terrifying. 
For others, the process of listening to one another and doing something that for decades we have thought that we are bad at, it will be embarrassing, it will be difficult, but for others, it could be going to a new neighborhood, it could be trying silent meditation, it could be being still. The rebuilding of our interior lives require us to reimagine new possibilities beyond what we thought we could do or what we thought we needed in the past. But just like on a societal or institutional level, rebuilding, well, it hardly ever is anything new. The reimagining of our own souls, the unleashing into new horizons and new ways of being. More often than not, someone's done it before. We return to old ways of being. There are ancestors to guide us, whether it's breaking free of gender norms or finding anti-racist practices or finding that returning again and again to a group of people that you don't always really like, but yet still, how, still somehow cast your lot in together? Well, someone's done it before. This returning to things that challenge us, challenge us to be who we are is different than we thought we needed or wanted. Well, ultimately, this, my friends, this is why we come to church. Hear this gently. Hear it in the deepest and most fervent love. Sometimes you don't like the people you go to church with. We all know this, and yet here we are, here we are together, finding new ways of being, practicing, and saying holy no's to that which insults and degrades human worth and all that is sacred. This is our collective work. This is why we come to church. I am trying to sell you back your own soul. This world and your soul, well, my people, at least my soul, it's a fixer-upper. We need a lot of work. But boy, are there good bones. May we work together. May we return again and again to do the work of scaffolding up new ways of being. May this holy kingdom be built on this earth with rooms for all of us. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. I love that you're asking Soul Matters groups to learn a song together. I hate that it's after I leave. <laughs> but I love that you will continue singing. And in that spirit, I invite you now to rise in voice, body, or spirit and join me in singing our closing hymn, Building a New Way. Breathe. 
pride and jealousy we are working to be free but we can feed our every need we can feed our every need we can feed our every need start Love that is the seed we can feed our every need. Peace and freedom is a cry. This is the last verse, let me hear it. Peace and freedom is a cry. Now that's a cry. or in body as we extinguish our chalice with unison words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This world will not die, my people. We sing a song beyond the grave. We start with love, and with each action, each moment, each day, ask, what is it that love demands of us? Go in peace. Go in love. Amen. <laughs>